everyone so uh, a little bit more of me but not for too long I thought what we would do is share some of the highlights of recent discussions and of our own thinking and ideation on what it is that MIT does that may <laughs> contribute to quality and that will tee us up after the break you're going to hear from John um, uh, sort of a, a, a holistic reflection and report on his experience in helping to build a new university. But this segment, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that happen at MIT. And what I thought I would do is start by arraying a small number of ideas in front of you for your contemplation and discussion. So we'll get John to weigh in, we'll get everyone in the room to ask questions, and hopefully we'll spur some useful thought and thinking. Uh, you'll be able to chit chat over the coffee break to follow up on some of the ideas as well. And then at the end of the day, our joint collaborative fireside chat will give us yet another chance to delve into these ideas. So with that spirit in mind, let me share a few thoughts with you. So I pulled out four themes to dig into. One of them is how we work with and use task forces. So what is the task force approach to setting a new vision, fleshing it out, and implementing it? I'll draw on a couple of examples from MIT's experience. The second is institutional mechanisms that invite in-depth feedback. And I'll lay out one of these examples in front of you for, again, you to look at and consider and maybe reflect on their relevance or, or not, or what they get you thinking about. Uh, we'll talk, we'll build on the conference theme um, by looking at different ways in which we both understand and then contribute to our innovation ecosystem. And then I have my own thoughts, which I'll be fascinating to hear John's um, uh, additions to and reflections on, on how we harness teaching and research as ways in which to improve overall quality. How do the two influence each other? How do they get us interacting with the ecosystem? So the next one is, this is always uh, dangerous. I, I created an animation and they, <laughs> they, sometimes they don't work out exactly as you imagine. So let's see, uh, we're, we're, we're in this uh, together. Okay, this one has worked so far. So MIT doesn't do this all the time. But every now and then, we step back and create a task force. And I put an example of one here. This one was called the work of the future. So sometimes a task force will look at a societal issue or a big idea. Other task forces have looked at very, uh, at ideas that are really important for MIT's internal future. So we did one on, um, it was called the education of the future. Is that what it was called? So that was in 2013, 14, I think it went into 15. That was a fascinating experience, as was this one. In both cases, MIT arrays a, a, a set of internal experts. Um, in the one on education, it then led to many committees being formed that were tasked with moving really quickly in mapping out and even doing quick pilot tests and experiments to flesh out ways in which MIT could innovate in education. Uh, by the way, if you were at our JWell Connections in the spring, you would have heard a nice, maybe two hour discussion on this very process. We shared with people the uh, report itself, but then we actually followed up and looked in our deep conversation with um, uh, Vice President for Open Learning, Sanjay Sarma, we actually dug into the 2014 ideas to see which ones came to fruition. And that report card was pretty impressive. The task force report came up with the very notion of the MicroMasters, which then was orchestrated and created, which then, which we started in um, supply chain and then led to others. And now those MicroMasters are firmly entrenched as a new way for MIT education to reach the world. In turn, they spawned other innovations across MIT. So that's one example. In this particular task force, we were looking at better jobs because MIT is a big player in the innovation landscape in the US. 
And we actually have been thinking a lot about how it is our education can serve the global and national economy. Uh, this task force got people thinking and talking about both the research, but also the action front of, uh, of this theme. Uh, and it drew in um, the work, it drew in Bill Bonvillian, who has actually had led MIT's Washington DC office. He was our government liaison person who worked with the Senate and with the US government on issues related to MIT. Sometimes these were advocacy, sometimes these were national themes, but Bill and Sanjay got together and wrote a book inspired, linked to the, the same theme that the task force had taken, but this time saying, what is a map for the nation or a map for the world on how to think about workforce education? So that book came out last year. Also related to that, we saw um, the Sloan Management Review, which is our sort of in-house management publication, has, this is the third year in a row, they've done a systematic survey um, that looks, it's a partnership with Deloitte, but that looks at trends and issues in the future of work. And this year's theme was the future of work is through workforce ecosystems. So you can find a variety of publications on that topic. So task force, book, spe you know, uh, annual survey, in-depth special issue of SMR with multiple articles. Um, and in fact, then this, then um, you can, see the, the website does a nice job of presenting past, ta past studies and framing the ideas that came out from this year's um, survey. Uh, we also see it linked to new courses. So Tom Koken, one of my colleagues at the Sloan School of Management, decided, decided he would create a new exec ed course called Leading the Future of Work. Um, and the Sloan School of Management uh, generates and produces content that brings this idea to many. So yes, it's marketing, but it's also thematically linked to the research, to the books, to the annual survey. This kind of puts an idea in the air. It gets folks all across MIT thinking about and wanting to contribute to the broader conversation. What is the future of work? And we've done this for other things. We've done this in looking at the future of biotechnology. I mean, way back, we did it with the automobile when we looked at the future of the automobile, uh, the machine that changed the world, really spawned people's thinking about that. And there are other themes that we could share with you where we see a report doesn't just fall as a report. It, it can create these really nice ripples throughout the ecosystem, new courses, new studies, new pieces of research, new books. So consider kind of putting ideas in the air <laughs> inside your university and how you do that using your own resources. Um, the second idea, so I'm just gonna array these four ideas in front of you and then invite the conversation. This one was a conversation we had in our university governance week. And one of the things we decided to pull out was this notion of the visiting committee. And I did some research. I don't know if you guys know this, but we actually established our first visiting committees in 1875. Um, MIT was founded in 1861. And the core idea at its founding was it was gonna be an earnest cooperation between industry and academia. It was not gonna be cynical. It was going to be a real cooperation from the get-go. And we were in many ways following Dewey's philosophy of American pragmatism, saying learning is effective when it speaks to the world. And it was baked into our DNA from the very beginning. As a result, MIT has embraced this notion of the visiting committee. The visiting committee is a mix of academics from elsewhere, uh, folks from industry, um, other stakeholders, and they have a strong right to come into a given group or department and ask difficult questions, expect issues that come up to be resolved so they can, they can actually, they have a level of kind of expecting accountability. And they get to have conversations, not just the super formal ones with department heads and senior faculty, but they have one-on-one -on -one meetings with students, with staff, with others. They collect information in incredibly valuable and varied ways. And MIT claims, and I have no reason not to doubt them, 
Right. They report, they report to provost, to the corporation, to department heads, and, and others. And there's the report, they have to actually write, a, I'm going to show you that in just, that's on the next slide. They have to write a report. But MIT claims this is one of the most, MIT's use of visiting committees is probably one of the strongest and most active of anywhere. So it's very much baked into how we think about our work. And indeed, this is the point you were making, John. They report to the um, entire sort of governance structure of MIT. The corporation is our board of trustees. Um, they report to the administration, including the provost. And they offer appraisal, advice, insight. Um, and interestingly enough, we don't only do academic departments. For instance, um, the Department of um, Athletics and Physical Education has a visiting committee. The libraries have a visiting committee. So we're taking seriously all chunks of the institute, saying each one of these deserves, it's not only scrutiny, it's also support. It's also advocacy, because um, we heard from our colleague in the Department of Mathematics, they desperately needed a new building. He used the visiting committee to advance the case and make the case to senior leadership about the value of the new building. And there's no hiding from the visiting committee. No, you cannot hide. You're, you're there, you're on the spot with the visiting committee. <laughs> and they can call in who they want to. So people get ready for this, departments spend a while. It's, it's outside of the formal um, certification and other processes. It's our own internal process that is open to scrutiny. Okay, so that was idea two. So idea three is I think we have maybe some cases explicitly, some places we just happened, but I think we've put a lot of effort into mapping and building the ecosystem. Um, one of the more controversial things, John, I'll be interested to hear your point on this, is um, for, for most of its history, MIT has been extremely proud to have an open campus. You can walk into pretty much any building. Um, now, some parts are less open than they used to be, but we still have, by and large, a very open campus. Um, and interestingly enough, you would, could trace the origins of OpenCourseWare, which is MIT Open Learning's commitment to put every single course we teach online. Every course, by default, should be put into an OpenCourseWare offering, and you can go find them. You can go to the OCW website and find the archive of pretty much any course that's been taught at MIT. They're not all updated, and some faculty don't do it, but most do. So we have a really good um, set of open course offerings, the parallel of our open campus. Um, we do create and build and invest in space that's open to many. Students, even after they've graduated, can you know spend can get a desk in various say in the Martin Trust Center for Entrepreneurship and work on their ideas. Um, we have open space in. We heard a bit about um, MIT Nano, the Nano um, Technology Institute, a building that MIT built, is very famously open to anyone at MIT. You don't have to have. Uh, affiliation in a particular department or course of study. You just need to be trained and then you can go and play with the machines if you have a good enough reason to do so. Um, and then we have institutions, institutes that are open or that are boundary spanning. Raygon is a joint venture with Harvard University. Um, the Broad is an institute that is not fully an MIT internal department. It's also open to the world, also uh, uh, in the biotech area. The engine is a hard tech, deep tech, uh, accelerator and incubator. And then we have many uh, research and, and programmatic offerings that, uh, build, that look to build um, ecosystems, including um, some of the work you heard about earlier that we presented at JWell Week. Uh, other areas include the membership, but perhaps the granddaddy of them all is the Industrial Liaison Program, uh, an MIT program that invites industry in as a member and in return introduces folks from industry who want to meet people at MIT. It's like a match 
production service. Um, and the cool thing is that that removes some of the barriers to industry coming and talking to a faculty member who might otherwise be hard to track down or get on their schedule for. They handle some of that. And then the ILP can hear and see the requests and ideas coming from industry and puts on annual programs, including um, very well-designed one and two day um, conferences that speak to the themes they hear from industry. So by being the matchmaker, they can also hear the requests coming from society. And that also enters the kind of ecosystem of ideas. Um, and these tools and methods for understanding ecosystems are the subject of study across multiple departments, as we heard. Uh, one big issue at MIT is uh, we often just do things. <laughs> and we have, uh, on a good day, it's very nice to have a 1,000 flowers blooming and to have multiple efforts to, for instance, map ecosystems. Uh, and uh, on a bad day, it feels like it's a jungle out there and you've got to do some weeding and pruning. So that's always a conversation across the community is we have multiple competing things that look similar. Um, and indeed, you know, you'll hear John and I have different views. So uh, for sure, we embrace that. But sometimes it also can make things a little complicated. Final point, um, our effort to invest in project-based learning really puts issues and ideas and questions at the fore. Um, one of my favorite examples is um, the chemical engineering's practice school, which was founded in the early 1900s. And this is, a, this is so ahead of its time. MIT sent its own personnel to go and live and work at industrial chemical engineering facilities owned by industry, where they would be there continually and they would actually hear what are the questions and ideas coming from chemical engineering factories and workplaces. They would then create opportunities, this is like 1905, for MIT students to go and do a project or a study in situ, having been shaped by the faculty, but also having the context provided by the MIT liaison, who's right there. And the traditions of that idea still reverberate throughout multiple programs, where we invest a lot in an ongoing dialogue with industry that allows the questions to come in that are really relevant to the workplaces. This enables students to land jobs, but it all, because they have done something important that really matters to a given industry or company, but it also gives faculty a sense of juicy, important, complex questions that they might want to train their attention to because they hear the industry coming to them and saying, this is an issue we need help with. Students might work on it in one way, faculty might work on it in another. So it can be an extremely generative relationship. I think I'll move on. The rest, the other ideas are, are uh, about doing research at all stages, early to late, and using uh, appointments, the, our ability to appoint students to different roles as vehicles for us to learn more about the world. So my students will often go out and find, help me find projects. In doing so, they get more savvy about industry, and they help me because they're doing some of the legwork. Uh, you do want to think about relationship management. If many of us are pestering the same company, how do we make sure we're all apprised of it and we're speaking consistently? And the more we do applied work, the more we have to bring in other adjunct and affiliated faculty. This happens with entrepreneurship a lot. And one of the core questions is, are they speaking in ways that are consistent with the evidence base? with the practice and with the ideas that we are developing and researching here in our institution. So that kind of balancing the practical with the grounded in, uh, in evidence is a key issue. All right, that's it. So John, a moment for you to offer thoughts or responses or for anyone from the room to ask a question or offer a reflection. Um, yeah, yeah the, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the, the issues, you know, for example, as a professor, one of the nice things about MIT are the opportunities that are brought forward in here. And we have industry does come in. In fact, right now I'm speaking to two 
to industrial partners that are interested in funding the kind of work that we do. Um, but there's always this tension between sort of town, well, in here industry and gown, the uh, university, in the sense that we do research. We're not doing work for hire. That's not what we do. We are doing research, and there has to be some, some sort of fundamental thing. So it's always, as we develop projects with these things, that there has to be something that is a little bit beyond just developing something for someone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet what happens is a lot of people want to do this because what they, it's actually a very good thing because the student gets to see that company and that company gets to see the student. And that, that kind of thing is, is um, it's actually good for hiring. You know, oftentimes you'll see somebody's very interested in hiring and the student says, no, 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 I've seen what they do. I don't really want to do it. Uh, but you have, you have those kinds of relationships develop. And the fact of the matter is, is I think one of the strengths of MIT is it is a thousand flowers. There are, a lot, roughly speaking, 1,100 faculty at MIT. And each of them are individualists expecting to go their own ways. Now, the opportunities allow us very frequently, particularly the engineers, for several to clan together to work for a, a larger project. The other thing is we have classes, for example, I'm involved in a design class right now, and the students, the, we actually have industrial mentors that come in to help the design teams working towards developing products. And these people bring a richness into the classroom that the faculty really can't do. Uh, or I must, it, they, they bring elements in that, for example, I don't carry. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is that. Um, there is also a tradition of being viciously critical of each other. Oh. The fact of the matter is, is that um, the idea is more important than the specifics of the individuals. That what we're doing is in terms of the argument, in terms of what's going on, people are putting different things out on the table. And I've seen some blood on the floor arguments about what we should be doing, okay? But the bottom line is, is, that, is that ultimately everybody understands that what we're trying to do is to go to a greater goal. And this is the way to do it. So, the other thing is your colleagues are generally critical of what you're doing. And that keeps you on, you know, keeps you in there. So it's the society that we're in. And, um, you know, obviously you respect your colleagues. You respect the students. You, that is part of the underlying thing here. But ultimately the ideas and sort of looking for the truth, whatever that is, is, uh, is a paramount thing. The visiting committees, they're, they go in, they talk to everybody. They talk to everybody, you know, individually. You don't know who they've talked to. Well, you know that they've talked to junior faculty, they've talked to the senior faculty, but any of the specific ideas don't come back. But the point is, is that the organization, it ultimately goes all the way to the top with recommendations. And sometimes what they do is they'll go in and they'll criticize the president and the provost. You're not doing this for this department. They need this, your mathematics point. Yeah. That happens. But on the other hand, there are also times where you know, the department is pulled out and like they're not doing this. They really need to work on this. And then also, sometimes there's a pat on the back, the occasional yeah. pat on the back. Really? It happens once <laughs> in a blue moon. Um, but there's a pat on the back as they, you know, they're really doing some really great things here and you should support it more. So those are some of the some of the feedback mechanisms and just embellishing on some yeah. of the stuff that Anjali did. Good. Yeah.